Don't you want devoted followers who leave their families for you, give their money to you, give their bodies to you, give up their lives for you, consider you God, and will kill for you? Don't you want to become a cult leader? Hello and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast where we also veer off the serial killer path to delve into other topics within our beloved true crime community. So I asked you guys if you wanted more podcasts on cults. Well, I was inundated with messages saying, yes, please. So let's go down the cult path for a while for our Wednesday podcasts. Today's podcast will be on Erval LeBaron, the Mormon Manson, who was the leader of a polygamous Mormon fundamentalist group. This one's pretty interesting and also lent itself to violence. So, here we go. Erval Morel LeBaron was born on February 22, 1925 in Galena, Chihuahua, Mexico. So, let's get into some history for that time. World War I had been over for about seven years, and world leaders realized that soldiers needed homes to return to. So in England, the then Prime Minister Lloyd George called for, quote, homes fit for heroes to be built. The British Ministry of Health created and published a manual which showed a pattern of simple housing designs cheap land and with low deposits. The United States increased home construction overall, but especially focused on key areas in Florida and Illinois, like Chicago, saw large numbers of new homes being built. The interest rates on the mortgages were low. Now, the idea behind this was great but it caused the housing market to crash in the United States and it became one of the heavier reasons for the beginning of the Great Depression. Also during this time, women were finally given the right to vote after the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. In Russia, the Russian Civil War ended and unfortunately, the famine began which killed an estimated 5 million people. The truly poor and hungry had to resort to cannibalism in order to not starve to death. Hunger was so prevalent that the seeds to grow the grain were eaten before they ever even made it into the ground. But relief was sent the United States sent food and medicine that helped to feed about 11 million people. On a happier note, Belgium hosted the Summer Olympics and the theme they chose was to remember the fallen from World War I. This was actually the first Olympic Games that showed the Olympic flag displaying, you know, the five interlocking rings that represent unity after the war. We see that Ireland was having the Irish Revolution, poor Ireland always fighting back then, and more importantly, Bloody Sunday, which left more than 31 people killed. British Army officers opened fire into a crowd at a Gaelic football match, killing 14 civilians. Martial law was declared, which followed ever-increasing violence. In Mexico, the Mexican revolutionary and military leader Pancho Villa surrendered in July after reaching a peace agreement with interim Mexican President Adolfo de la Huerta, which effectively ended the Mexican Revolution. In Canada, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Force was established after merging the Royal Northwest Mounted Police and the Dominion Police. So this was the atmosphere that Erval was born into. 
And before we get into Herbal's story, it's pretty necessary that we get into the background that influenced him to be the person that he became. This takes kind of some twists and turns, a lot of names thrown around, so try to stay with me. I'll, I'll do the best I can. So, in 1890, the Mormon Church officially announced that they were abandoning the practice of polygamy. For those that might not be aware, polygamy is just where a person can have multiple wives or husbands. It's usually always a man having multiple wives. So, of course, there were some that were not happy with this decision. There was a group that decided to move to Mexico where they could continue to be polygamous Mormons. So, of course, they were excommunicated, which is just a fancy word for kicked out of the church. One such man was Alma Dayer LeBaron Sr. He was born in 1886. He was also the grandson of Benjamin F. Johnson. Now, our boy Benjamin was a confidential secretary and sometimes business partner with THE Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith is the founder of the Latter-day Saint movement. Yeah, so Alma, once the Mormons changed their stance on polygamy, found himself in quite the predicament. He had two wives and therefore was kicked out. He took his wives and his plethora of children and moved from Utah down to Chihuahua, Mexico. Now Alma worked as a painter and held odd jobs to take care of his family. Associates described him as a hardworking but energetic man. He bought a house that really did need some love, but he fixed it up as he could. Now, this man had, oh, so many children, but some of them didn't necessarily follow him to Mexico. So he had 11 of his children total with him south of the border. In 1924, as we said, he uprooted his family from Utah, moved to Mexico. Once there, they started a farm they called Colonia LeBaron. The children's upbringing centered on religion and Alma's obsession with heavenly visions. The children mirrored their father, of course, and also became deeply preoccupied with all matters of faith. So in 1934, Alma sent a written request for permission to return to the church, but it was denied. He died in 1951, never being readmitted to the LDS church. Okay, so after his death, seven of his sons, at various times, believed himself to be the one who was going to fulfill the premillennial demi-messianic priesthood office or offices. So let's break that down for a second. Premillennialism, according to Christianity, is the belief that Jesus will physically return to the earth, or what most of us know as the second coming, before the millennium, which after is supposed to be a thousand years of peace, you know, the golden age. It's based on the literal interpretation of Revelation 20 verses 1 through 6 in the Christian Bible which described Jesus' reign for a thousand years. Demi just means half or partially, sometimes something that's slightly inferior. Messianic can mean, quote, related to the Messiah, which for this story means Jesus, or it can also mean, quote, fervent or passionate. So all of these brothers, they all believed that they would hold office as the, quote, one mighty and strong, unquote. And that's a term that you need to remember for this story, one mighty and strong. This is supposed to be an unknown person who was the subject of an 1832 prophecy by Joseph Smith himself, who was, again, the founder of the Latter-day Saints movement. Now, 
The prophecy says that the one mighty and strong would, quote, set into order the house of God and arrange for the inheritances of the Latter-day Saints, unquote. Now, many have claimed to be this person, while others claimed to have identified who this person was. This group, or the sons of Alma, also believed that they would be the presiding patriarch, which is a church-wide leadership role within the priesthood for men only. Duties are presiding over council meetings, ordain other patriarchs, and administer patriarchal blessings. At one point, this office was one of the highest and most important offices of the church's priesthood. It is the expectation that the man who holds this office will then leave it to his sons and they to their sons, and so on. So I know that that's quite a bit. Are you still with me so far? I hope so. Okay, now in the 1950s, after their father's death, some of the brothers visited Salt Lake City, Utah, and one of them, Joel, decided to establish his own polygamous church as he believed it was passed down from him to Alma. It was a family enterprise with relatives serving in leadership positions, including our boy Ervil. He called his community, or Joel called the community, the Church of the Firstborn of the Fullness of Times, or the Church of the Firstborn for short. The three eldest brothers held the positions of power, Joel, of course, ordaining himself as the president, then R. Wesley and Florin just under him. So Joel then said that he had been visited by 19 former prophets. Some of these prophets include Jesus himself, Abraham, Moses, Elijah, and of course, Joseph Smith. So then in 1956, these brothers all returned to Chihuahua, Mexico, and several months later, our boy Ervil LeBaron published a pamphlet called, quote, Priesthood Expounded, unquote, which did become a foundational text for the order. Now here is a really small excerpt from his pamphlet. Quote, Priesthood Expounded, the principles of succession in priesthood authority and the true pattern of priesthood government. When God offers a blessing or knowledge to a man and he refuses to receive it, he will be damned. To become a joint heir of the heirship of the Son, one must put away all his false traditions. Joseph Smith let thy bowels also be full of charity towards all men and to the household of faith and let virtue garnish thy thoughts unceasingly then shall thy confidence wax strong in the presence of god and the doctrine of the priesthood shall distill upon thy soul as the dews from heaven Unquote. So Ervil was, at that time, serving as Joel's kind of second-in-command during the very early years of their church's beginnings. And they were very minorly successful. I mean, they were able to increase their group to about 30 people in the beginning, families who lived in both Utah and a community called Los Molinos in the Baja California Peninsula. The members of the Church of the Firstborn was one of the few Mormon fundamentalist churches to have engaged in active proselytization. Most of the time, they focused on attracting Mormon fundamentalists from other groups to join them, including preaching and distributing their information at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, which is this hugely famous Mormon college. They also did the same at the gates of Temple Square in Salt Lake City. Temple Square comes across, at least to me, as sort of a mecca for Mormons. 
Ervil's priesthood expounded was distributed at both places, and they were, like I said, minimally successful in converting a few over to their offshoot of Mormonism. In 1956, Brother R. Wesley stated that he believed he had been sent to prepare the way for the one mighty and strong, who would be, quote, an Indian prophet. Joel was on board, but Ervil was not happy about it. In December of 1957, another of Alma's sons, Ben, wrote a letter to a man of standing within the LDS church, stating that he, Ben, believed himself to have actually received the birthright from his father. He also said that he truly believed he was the one mighty and strong, sent to redeem the LDS people from spiritual bondage. It goes without saying that this didn't really go over too well. So in the 1960s, Ervil was the presiding patriarch of their group and second in command. Then in 1967, Ervil apparently challenged Joel's leadership, stating that he, not Joel, was the proper head of the church. Now, Joel and his other leadership panel denounced Ervil and basically fired him. So the membership was split into two groups. This split would cause ever increasing tensions between the two groups that were also family. So a bit of a side note, Ervil by this point had at least 13 wives and several of them he married while they were still entirely too young to be brides. He fathered more than 50 children. He raised several stepchildren, and it is rumored that he also slept with some of his own daughters. Now, one daughter, Anna, spoke recently about what life was like for them as children. She said, quote, we were taught that we were celestial children, having been born from the prophet Ervil LeBaron, and we believed it. Even though we were treated so poorly, we still believed we were celestial children." Unquote. She said that she was only in the same room with her father maybe a handful of times in her entire life, and that Ervil used fear to manipulate and control his people that at least the children were terrified of not doing exactly what they were told. Anna spoke about being born in Mexico and always being on the run from the law, sleeping on filthy, disgusting mattresses and scavenging for food in trash cans with the other children from the cult. She says they were told they were being persecuted because they were God's chosen people, and the outside world just didn't understand that. The children were made to perform basically slave labor to help make money for the family, and any slight offense could lead to horrific beatings. The girls were groomed from the beginning on how to be dutiful and obedient wives, that polygamy was a good thing, and that they'd be married off once they were at a quote, meritable age, which for their group was 15 years old. So in August of 1972, Ervil and the people that split from Joel's group formed their own offshoot that they named the Church of the Firstborn of the Lamb of God, and they established this in San Diego, California. They chose this name on purpose because you see there is a prophecy in the Book of Mormon stating there would eventually be only two groups of people in the end times, the Church of the Lamb of God and the Church of the Devil. So you see what Ervil did there. Now he began to preach that he was the one mighty and strong and said his own brother Joel was to be put to death. Within that same month, Joel LeBaron was assassinated with a gunshot to the head by one of Ervil's followers. 
Now, the group in Baja, California was then given to the youngest brother, Verlin, after Joel's murder. And Verlin became the, quote, president of the Twelve Apostles, unquote. Verlin also had more than one wife. Six is what I read. Verlin would travel from Baja to Las Vegas for work so that he could, you know, make enough money to build houses for and support all of his wives, but they still struggled financially. Okay, so Verlin and the other brothers obviously found out about Joel's murder that had been basically ordered by their brother, Ervil based on, quote, blood atonement. So what's blood atonement? It's basically the idea that the atonement of Jesus does not singularly redeem specific horrid capital sins. So if you've done something truly terrible, in order to atone for those sins, you must be killed in such a way that your blood gets on the literal ground as a sacrifice and offering to God. Now, of course, the LDS Church said that this was not okay circa 1889, but remember, these guys were excommunicated long ago. But to the Mormon fundamentalists, blood atonement is still an important doctrine. Joseph Smith himself firmly believed in capital punishment, and there's so much more to it, but you get the idea. Now, Ervil didn't like that, obviously. He put Verlin and Verlin's many wives on the hit list, if you will, forcing one of Verlin, his wives, the multitude of children to escape and live in Nicaragua, and they lived in unbelievably horrible conditions. But it was certainly better than being dead. And during all of this, Ervil and his entourage rarely stayed in one place for very long. And usually they pulled up stakes, as it were, conveniently just ahead of the authorities, who were trying desperately to keep dibs on this family's activities. His cult operated out of Mexico, Dallas, Texas, Denver, Colorado, San Diego, California, and Salt Lake City, Utah. In 1974, Ervil was arrested and put on trial for his brother Joel's murder, and he was convicted only it was overturned on a technicality and word around the campfire was that the technicality was bought and paid for. Very shortly after, Ervil's followers raided the church and community that Verlin was presiding over and it was destroyed. Now, they obviously didn't find Verlin, of course, because he was in Nicaragua, but still, a couple of people were killed. But, you know, Ervil wasn't stopping with just Verlin. He was also looking toward other polygamous leaders that he considered rivals. Now, remember his brother R. Wesley had stated the one mighty and strong would be an Indian prophet? Well, another man by the name of Bob Simmons, he was a rancher. He was also a polygamist and he was trying to minister to Native Americans for this very reason. And he got caught in the crosshairs. Ervil ordered his murder as well. In 1977, when Ervil was 52 years old, he ordered the assassination of Rulon C. Allred, who was the leader of another Mormon fundamentalist sect called the Apostolic United Brethren. Now, Rulon was a homeopath and a chiropractor in Salt Lake City. You would know Rulon's granddaughter because she is Christine from the reality TV series, Sister Wives. So this time, Ervil's 13th wife, Rena, along with her daughter and Ervil's stepdaughter, Ramona, killed Rulon. Rena would later be tried for the murder, but she was acquitted. And then she actually later 
wrote a rather telling book stating that Herbal used mind control and fear tactics to control his followers. Herbal sent his 10th wife, Vonda, to murder one of his own hitmen because he had decided he wanted to leave the church. And that's not the only person Vonda was sent out to kill. See, if anyone became critical of Ervil's practices, well, that was a very dangerous stance to take. Ervil was even linked to the death of his very own 17-year-old daughter, who was also pregnant with her second child at the time because she wanted to leave the group. She was actually strangled to death, and so all of this insanity was all happening in 1977. Right, so in June of 1979, Ervil LeBaron was arrested by the Mexican police and extradited to the United States. There, he went to trial and was found guilty of ordering Rulon's murder. He was sentenced to life in prison at the Utah State Prison in 1980. Now, while he was in prison, he wrote a 400-page, what he called a Bible, called the Book of the New Covenants. And within this book was a commandment to kill church members who were disobedient. And it also included a hit list. Somewhere around 20 copies were printed and sent out to his cult members. And then, boom! Ervil was found dead in his prison cell in August of 1981. Couple of different reasons. From an apparent heart attack, some say it was a seizure, he was 56 years old, think what you will. Then two days later, after Ervil was found dead, two days later, Verlin died in a quote, car accident in Mexico City. Verlin's grandson later went on to say the family did not think that that was a coincidence, and I tend to agree. Three of the people on Ervil's hit list were murdered at the same time in June of 1988 at precisely 4 p.m. One of his former followers was killed along with the eight-year-old daughter. One of Ervil's stepsons was also killed in the same way, and yet another man was shot multiple times in his Houston, Texas office. These murders were referred to as the four o'clock murders. There were seven killers and five were eventually found guilty. One of the killers testified against her own siblings for immunity. It is estimated that as of today, somewhere between 25 to 30 people have been killed based on Ervil's writings in prison alone. So, you know, hey, what's going on with the dead prophet's family now? Sources say the older of his children, namely one named Aaron, who has been the heir apparent, are teaching the younger generations the same doctrine. They preach from Ervil's prison writings and apparently have meetings where members are told, quote, this is the way it is. This is what God wanted. And we're here to carry on and establish the kingdom of God. You'll reach the highest kingdom of heaven if you commit this murder. You'll be an elect in the kingdom of God, unquote. They are also apparently stealing cars in cities like Phoenix, Arizona, then driving them across the border to sell in Mexico for as much as $10,000 a piece. And there are rumors that the cult members are involved in drug trafficking. Now remember that. So this Mexican Mormon sect has ties to our government that might surprise you. You might have heard of, oh, I don't know, Mitt Romney, the senator from Utah. He previously served as the 70th governor of Massachusetts in the early 2000s and was a United States presidential nominee in the 2012 election. 
Okay, so his great grandfather, Miles Romney, established a polygamous group in Mexico in 1885 to escape federal prosecutors in Utah because they were denying polygamists the right to vote, the right to be a juror, or to run for office. According to a source, the Romneys came back from Mexico and crossed the border illegally twice. But when they were in Mexico, they were directly connected to, you guessed it, Colonia Le Baron, and did pretty well for themselves. Mitt Romney's father, former Michigan governor George Romney, was born in Chihuahua in 1907. Yes, I'm not kidding. He and his family came across the border illegally. One of Mitt's relatives, Meredith Romney, back in 2009, was one of the remaining two Colonia LeBaron leaders left. She was kidnapped and held for ransom in this cave. The ransom was paid. Now the ransom was paid, but she was also kidnapped with the grandson of Joel LeBaron. And his grandson was Eric. Okay, so this would have been... Ervil's nephew. So Eric's brother was the founder of a militia known as SOS or Safe Organized Society, but it's technically called Sociedad Organizada Segura. The SOS is an independent armed neighborhood watch group. Eric's brother was taken and shot to death, his body found the next day. These were Joel's kids. So get this, the Juarez cartel, and I think most of you have probably heard of that one, were the supposed killers and they draped some kind of banner on Eric's body stating that he was an informant. But basically, Mitt Romney's background story involves polygamy, running from the law, illegal immigration twice, and present day Romney relatives in an armed militia. And so also remember Ervil's daughter, Anna. Well, she states that, you know, she believes the danger is 100% in the past now with regards to her family and the polygamous Mormon cult in Mexico. Do you think so? I don't think so. Because while I was researching this, I shit you not, I came across quite the coincidence. Do you guys remember the story back, oh, late last year about the family that was ambushed by an armed group in Mexico and most all of them were killed? At least one of the vehicles was burned with, and they found like five charred bodies inside. I mean, you know, I feel bad for the people that died, but do you remember that story? Guess who spoke to a reporter for ABC News about the whole ordeal? A guy named Julian LeBaron. Yeah, he stated he was a relative of the family that was murdered and said the family was on their way to Chihuahua, Mexico, less than 100 miles from the Arizona border, which is apparently in the middle of a, quote, territorial dispute by several drug cartels. Three women and six children were killed in this ambush. Eight other children survived the massacre and many others were injured. It was like this whole convoy of people headed to Chihuahua. Julian LeBaron said he went with the authorities to the scene to help collect the bodies of the dead and look for survivors. Okay, so I'm getting a little excited. Julian LeBaron was used in a recruitment video by Nexium or NXIVM cult leader, Keith Ranieri. Now, I would love to get into all of that, but it's a story all in and of itself. So let me know if you wanna hear about that one. Julian has his own pretty outspoken past. So the ABC article I found went on to say, quote, The family members were U.S. citizens, but lived in a Mormon community called Lamora, unquote. 
It also went on to say that the family maintained dual citizenship, but that the family had lived in Mexico for decades. So perhaps I'm wrong, and that's supremely possible. But it sounds like that cult and the violence behind it is actually still quite current. Thanks for listening. <laughs>